We have five wonderful presentations coming up. So our topic here is sort of a topic we sort of teed up earlier in the day, the relationship of research to clinical care in return of the results uh, and incidental findings to the family. So as I noted, we have five wonderful talks, some of them specifically on the core issues of this topic, a few on sort of subsets of this topic. Um, as we noted earlier, this is really a very, very core issue because this is one scenario, as the paper we're discussing notes, the actual you know, responsibilities related to the research subject um, are no different and maybe even lesser than they are in the clinical setting. Whereas other times where we're talking about special relationships in the research setting, we are in fact looking to a special relationship, a need to get informed consent in a better, uh, a more, you know, refined way than we do in the clinical setting. Whereas in here, we're comparing the clinical context as sort of stronger in terms of an obligation to, to return these results to others, to family members. So it really is a fascinating scenario. So let's look forward to everybody and, and what they say. Um, our first talk is from Susan Wolf, and I guess Susan, you're talking on behalf of yourself, Barbara Koenig and Wiley Burke. And Susan, we all know incredibly well, so no need to say all the wonderful things about her. Just keep them wonderful, only the wonderful. So I'm switching hats here now. Uh, to talk about a paper very much in progress, and so we're eager to get your thoughts. And so on behalf of myself and Barbara Koenig and Wiley Burke, we're going to try out some ideas on you um, to talk about a very challenging topic. Uh, trying to bring to an ongoing conversation about translational genomics this new twist return of results to family. Uh, so the context for this is a challenging conversation about where are we in this picture? You know, sort of where's Waldo? Is he on the research side of the fence? Is he on the clinical side of the fence? Those of you who were in this room in the prior session saw Mark Rothstein put up a very helpful slide trying to schematize some of the differences between the rules and norms that apply in research, where the relationship to the research participant is really very different from the relationship in the clinical sphere. In the research context, the goal is really to generate generalizable knowledge. Uh, it's not a fiduciary relationship. The law that applies is very different. Uh, there's a protocol, it's approved by an IRB usually, and so our entire approach is quite different. But in the world of translational genomics, as this magic word translational is now being used to signify, it's pretty complicated to figure out exactly what mix of norms, of rules we're talking about. Now, why is that? Um, because there are both research dimensions and clinical dimensions to what is going on. One of the studies I'm adverting here to is the CSER studies, which is a collection of studies, the Clinical Sequencing Exploratory Research Studies, and that'll be the next slide. But these are studies, that they are studies. I mean, they're funded by the National Institutes of Health. Uh, participants and uh, interaction with Investigators is governed by the common rule. Uh, research standards apply, and an IRB has approved the protocol. And it's an investigation asking how should we do uh, genomic and, and exome sequencing? What standards should apply? All of that looking toward a day when we will more fully integrate these technologies into clinical care. And we know there are a lot of pieces of the puzzle that are not yet in place for deployment in the clinical context, even though there are institutions that already are using genomics clinically. There's a big conversation. Uh, Robert uh, referenced Heidi Reams. She's a leader in this conversation, but a number of people in the room are part of it. 
on what standards of analysis should apply when you're doing genome and exome analyses. Trying to standardize even things you would think we'd have standardized by now, like variant calling, um, interpretation and the like. This, this really is still in motion. And of course, genomic understanding itself is in motion. Uh, we're still dealing with a large number of variants of unknown significance, uh, domains of the genome where we have poor coverage, uh, weak databases, particularly for some populations, some subpopulations that weaken the confidence we have in our interpretation. So there's a lot still in play that very well justifies the need for research. On the other hand, let's move Waldo to the clinical side of this. A number of these projects, many of them, are being conducted in affected populations. So for example, adults with a certain type of cancer, as in our you know, study that underlies this conference, pancreatic cancer. Uh, and uh, often the genomic findings, though generated in a research context, are then being used to make clinical decisions. Is there a target, a new treatment target for this cancer in a patient who has failed other treatment options? Indeed, um, this second to last bullet references a, a study that came out in the Journal of Law, Medicine, and Ethics earlier this year, led by Gail Henderson, who's at this conference. I was on the study with a number of other people where we looked across the CSER projects at their consent forms and what they said about the study, and we found in a number of cases that these genomic results were going into the medical record, not all of them, but uh, enough so that you begin to get the picture, which is there's an interesting mix here of research dimensions and clinical dimensions. So here are just examples. It's not just CSER and those very important projects. There are the EMERGE network projects, where EMERGE stands for electronic medical records and genomics. Uh, and as the name suggests, those studies go yet another step, where they ask not just how do we do genomics, how do we get it to the level that warrants a greater clinical integration, but they also add the electronic medical record into the mix. How should that figure? How should the genomic information be represented in the EMR or the electronic health record? What kind of signaling can we be doing to clinicians to help support their understanding of what is sometimes complex information and their sense of what to do with it? And there are other uh, studies, the Pharmacogenomics Research Network, and we've got a logo down here for Ignite. The, the names are getting catchier over time in these projects, uh, and there are others. So, so what I'm saying is that the context for this starts out translational, where translational means we are working to move, to translate a certain set of technologies and practice from the research side of the river, you know, being here by the Mississippi River, I think about rivers, the research side of the river over to the clinical side of the river. That's really our overarching goal. Now, within that context, let's zoom the camera in a little bit on return of results in these studies. That itself, I would argue, is a translational practice. Even if you weren't in the context of CSER or IGNITE or one of these, you were in a simpler design where you were clearly on the research side of the river, return of results is all about, huh, we found this result in the course of performing the research, whether it's a primary result or an incidental or secondary finding, and we're concerned about it. We're concerned about its clinical implications on the other side of that river. And so we ask you the question, should we offer this research-generated information back to the research participant 
or some combination of the participant and the clinician on the other side of the river so they can then pursue it clinically. And this is where that CLIA squabble comes in that we alluded to this morning. On the research side of the river, is there an obligation to validate, to confirm the result in a CLIA certified lab to get to that level of clinical certainty before you set off the alarm bells by handing this result to the participant and to the participant's clinician? Or is it acceptable to say, hey, look, full warning, Research generated information, we're confident enough in it that we want to convey it to you, but on the other side of the river, where all the clinical stuff happens, you got to get it reconfirmed and then fully analyzed. So it's a handoff question. How, when, who does that handoff? So even that should suggest to you that this practice itself is, it, is translational. It's about moving information from the research side of the river over to the clinical side of the river. And there are debates like this CLIA debate about you know, which set of rules should apply, when should they kick in as the information moves. So now we've got translational squared, right? Because we've got the sequencing studies that are themselves about translation, and now we've added what is fundamentally a translational practice into that equation. And this is really uh, arguing that further, the, the theories, the arguments that we have evolved, think of Henry Richardson's work, some of it with Leah Belsky, on ancillary care obligations as an underpinning to return of results. I'm kind of talking shorthand. Really, Henry Richardson is a philosopher at Georgetown University who asked a very interesting question. The question was, we know there's a big contrast nodally between the, the obligations and the ethical relationship between researchers and participants over here versus the clinician and patient where there's a fiduciary relationship, full clinical duties to act in the medical interests of that patient as the patient understands it through their value system, that there is that contrast. But what Henry asked is, if the researchers over here find information of potential clinical import, do they have some kind of care obligation? Some, it's not going to be the full-blown one on the other side of the river, but some kind of care obligation, a limited one. And he develops a very robust argument that the answer under some conditions is yes. I'm just throwing that out as a prominent illustration of translational ethics work in order to cope with these translational issues. So let's move to families. Now I think we've got it cubed. You know, if, we, if before we did translational squared, we've moved into translational cubed. Because you're asking a question now, not only about whether the investigator should be offering back information to a participant in research for some kind of movement across the bridge, across the river to the clinical sphere, but whether there should be some communication with people who in many cases aren't, aren't research participants or patients at all. I understand there are other designs, family registries and all that, but bear with me. I'm trying to illustrate how we've really added a further complexity. Even over on the clinical side of the river, they would be classically strangers to that clinical relationship, which is why it's, you know, in the clinical genetics world such a big deal should they get any information. So you can see how we've really added to the translational issues here. Um, and we can ask a lot of questions about return to family through this translational lens. I mean, we already are dealing with all sorts of uncertainties, vexing uncertainties, in terms of do we really have confidence in this genomic set of results to offer it as 
return of results or incidental findings to the participant. We've still got this enormous VUS problem, findings not fully validated, et cetera. And when you talk about return to family, you've really heightened the problem because the whole point of return to family is in many ways premised on a prediction that there is a shared, a lo enough likelihood of shared result and enough likelihood of benefit from communicating what you think is likely to be a shared result, that it makes sense to even engage in this practice. So um, some of the uncertainties that have been so vexing in return of results to participants are really even more vexing when you get to return to family, which is, I think, part of the reason it's such a hard problem. And there, you know, we are just embarking, really, as a community on trying to have the conversation that will hopefully yield best practices. So how do we make progress with this question? Um, one of the ways we might think about making progress is to back up and say, you know, we spend a lot of time worrying about di the dichotomy. Are we on the research side or the clinical side? Maybe one thing we should learn from, gosh, what's it's been, a, a decade or so of frankly translational genomics work is that it's not a dichotomy is that actually it's a continuum. And that bridge in between them, we need to take seriously and frankly develop rules for that bridge. Um, if it's research-generated information, the research safeguards should still apply. But that's not going to fully answer all the questions like the CLIA dispute, like what rises to the level of something that ought to be returned. But maybe we really ought to think about the translational continuum as not just a struggle between two poles, but as a domain in and of itself. And there are suggestions here in the slide about things we might do as we bring that frame, that rejection of the old dichotomy, into return of results to family. Um, things like creating quite a high threshold for family return because of the heightened uncertainties about shared variants, what is their importance to family. Um, of course, requiring family member agreement to receive any of this. You heard even from Pearl O'Rourke's uh, and uh, collaboratively with Laura Beskow and Conrad Fernandez, their presentation and the prior group that for an IRB even, thinking if you're going to return to family, how should we think about this family person? I mean, is this another research subject who just kind of wandered in off the planes? Uh, not literally wandered in, but really how should we conceptualize who that person is? And the real question we're asking is what set of obligations attend? So let me just wrap up by saying, um, I think there is potential benefit all along the translational continuum, including in clinical genomics, from rejecting the old dichotomy and instead taking seriously all the steps along this spectrum, and particularly focusing in on return of results to family, we know already it comes up all the way along. In the research sphere, we've got an older conversation we've alluded to a number of times, even in clinical genetics, pre-genomics. And so making progress on this issue is going to yield benefit all along, on both sides of the river and on the bridge in between. And larger implications. I think what we might begin to learn from this is that we need to think more creatively than get, just getting stuck on the dichotomy as fascinating as it is to keep saying, saying to one another, oh, is this, this seems to admix research and clinical care. We know that already. Actually, there are other forms of research that admix this. Even there's a long, old conversation about clinical trials. Uh, there, you know, my mentor, Jay Katz, used to go on at great length about some of the difficulties when a researcher wore two hats and was also a clinician. It's not a brand new problem. 
this admixture. But I think the emergence of this frankly translational zone and its illumination through the very important research going on in Caesar and Emerge and PGRN and others gives us an opportunity to really describe those challenges and give a much fuller account and develop a normative argument about how to if you will, pave the translational road. We've got all these rules for research over here, we've got all these rules for clinical, and it's kind of a bumpy, unpaved road in between that we have an opportunity to really get under control. So thank you, and thanks, of course, to my co-authors for this conversation in progress. Next up, we have Bonnie Leroy on what can return a family in the context of research learn from return in the context of clinical care? Thank you. So um, I'm a genetic counselor, and I'm going to talk about what happens in the clinical setting. Um, and it's actually, I'm going to talk about what typically happens in the clinical setting, recognizing that, in fact, there are exceptions to this, and also wanting to... Um, to say that for the most part, exceptions to what typically happens in a clinic as far as talking to patients and families and disseminating this information through families, if it's an exception, it's probably not in the literature because it's not supported by the law and it's certainly not supported um, by the, by the um, guidelines that I'm going to show you. And so I can be fairly brief here. Those are in uh, your handouts there. Um, so just an overview of process of returning test results in the clinical arena and talking to families. Um, typically involves counseling the patient about risks and benefits of testing prior to testing. Now we all know that that doesn't always happen. Um, and, and again, exceptions to the rule. Um, we could all, anybody in the clinical setting can come up to, with exceptions in the rule um, where families where, or individuals have gotten test results through the mail without any counseling whatsoever, um, or, or in fact, um, you hadn't, didn't have a chance to talk to somebody ahead of time, um, um, and, and uh, the family members having the testing uh, died before you got a chance to talk to them. But for the most part, testing involves talking to patients and families, and individuals and mostly, but a lot of individuals bring family members about what this test can tell you, what it can't tell you, and what the results might look like and what you might do with them and how they might, in fact, um, impact your family members. And it involves anticipatory guidance and helping um, people talk to their family members, thinking about what it might look like if you talk to your family members about your test results, what problems they might foresee, and offering strategies to help patients talk to their family members. Offering them strategies such as, we'll, we'll give you a letter, you can share that with your family members. Um, if you'd like, you can bring your family in, we'll talk to your family. But, but that's, that's pretty much the strategy for helping families um, um, disseminate genetic testing information uh, through, through all members. So what does the literature look like about family communication? There are studies that look at do patients communicate with family members? Who do they communicate within a family? Um, what do they communicate? What are the barriers and how to facilitate uh, communication? Most of the publications in the genetic counseling literature focus on cancer. So that's what I'm going to talk about here, but there are some papers on Huntington's disease and Fragile X as well. Um, so family communication about hereditary breast and ovarian uh, cancer. The key points in the study, and I think that I thought were really key for us, the literature on risk perception in women from high-risk families reveals a persistent overestimation of risk even after counseling. And I think that's an important point because we're relying on the proband to disseminate information in the fam among the family members. Sometimes they're quite sure what they're disseminating. Um, the, in the literature, uh, the literature talks about the communication in families being stronger among females. Women talk to women. Um, moms are key figures. If you can find a mom, you're, you're golden. She'll help you and tell everybody. Um, it's true. <laughs> um, and most families, most people who were asked could identify a family member they didn't want to talk to. Um, adoption, divorce, remarriage, family rifts, all kinds of things are barriers. Privacy was a major issue in the literature. It was reported as a major issue, and what was meant by privacy was that they just didn't want some family members to know this was happening to them. Um, 
Um, life events changed, life events fostered the communications or, or didn't. Um, and this I think is key, communication was significantly lower in Asian and African American families telling us that culture is an issue and it's big. Um, more on hereditary breast and ovarian cancer, three main characteristics, three main themes in breast cancer families. The first in the family, the proban to have testing, is the person who seems to be responsible now, and they take on a special role that's sometimes difficult. Um, discussions in the families change, that's a new word, change over, um, change over time. And, um, and so what people might say to somebody one, in one point in time, they might, they might talk to somebody differently in another point in time. Um, individuals, in fact, feel more or less, if you think about our own families, connected to some people, but not to others. Um, and the effects, okay, the effects seem to relate to family cancer his, uh, history, how many people in the family have cancer, how much the family knows that there is a family, of, that the cancer is in their family. Um, relationships, some families are very tight, some families are not. Coping strategies, communication patterns, all of the things that I think Mary Daly talked about. Um, I, I pulled out some colon cancer studies because it then brings in one other issue, which um, I guess could be considered an, a cultural issue, in that um, the, it, just, just like in the breast cancer families, um, responsibility of informing relatives fell on the proband. The immediate family members were often informed, but the distant family members were often not informed. Gender differences were big. Men didn't talk to family members. And if they, if, they, if they were asked to talk to family members, they often needed help talking to family members. Um, and, and the last point is, is simply genetic counseling. So there you go. Summary of the literature, genetics. Genetic practitioners do discuss the need for communication within families, but the responsibility falls primarily on the, on the proband, and this is in the clinical setting. Most probands intend to communicate, and they do talk to um, close family members, but distant family members sometimes get left out. In many cases, non-communication happens because people are trying to protect a family member. They, don't, they, they, they feel like their mother, they don't want to put undue stress on their mother or their brother or their sister, where they perceive the stress is too much. Um, in some cases, patients don't want to talk to a family member. Um, there are barriers in a family, as uh, Mary Daly alluded to, that are sometimes you, know, you can't fix um, if a family's broken and not working well together. Um, the last sentence came out of a couple of the studies, and I think it's an ideal, and I think it's difficult to do, and that is involve an entire family in this discussion from the beginning before the testing happens. So what are the, what are the guidelines? Well. Mark already pr brought up the guidelines from the American Society of Human Genetics that um, basically support the, the uh, rule of confidentiality, that patients have a right to keep their information confidential, and that disclosure was permitted only in exceptional cases, and Mark talked about this. Um, and at the end, it summarizes it up by saying that at a minimum, healthcare professionals have, a, have the obligation to inform patients that their family members are at risk, but does not support on a routine basis informing family members. Um, the American Medical Association has a very similar statement that I believe is derived from or, um, or came from the American Society of Human Genetics, as well as the President's Commission looks very similar, and so does the Institute of Medicine. Um, ASCO has a statement, and I've underlined what I think is the important point, which ASCO believes that the cancer care provider's obligation, if any, to at-risk relatives are best fulfilled by communication of family risk to the person undergoing the testing. Again, placing the burden of communicating in the family um, to the proband. So what does it look like in real life? So um, I teach uh, genetic counseling students and we have an ethics course every year and every year we have um, the attorney for the academic uh, health uh, center come in and talk to us about all kinds of issues. One of the issues we ask about is this. And I just emailed him the other day and I said, I'm just checking if anything changed. And he wrote back and said, like I said, and I'm like, okay, got it. Um, he, he, he confirmed that in Minnesota, there's no established duty to warn, that there are no cases that tell us what will happen if a patient's wishes for confidentiality and privacy are not preserved. Um, but there, in fact, there is law 
um, about the obligation to protect the patient's confidentiality, and um, and this is this is uh, pretty much what we follow in the clinic. So I can tell you that's what's happening in the clinic there. I have references here, and they're too small to read. And thank you. Okay. Thank you, Bonnie. That was great. Um, so next we have Dr. Norlane Linder uh, should return to family hinge on clinical actionability. How should that be specified, actionability in the care of family members themselves, and what does accountability mean in this context? So I was happy to hear the uh, questioning of what actionable meant come up several times this morning, and uh, don't expect entirely clear answers on that. Um, actionable has been promoted recently in the last decade as, as an important parameter in judging whether or not gene mutation should be reported in both the clinical and the research setting. And really its definition in words is not especially controversial. So Karen Mashke from the Hastings Center uh, defined actionable to mean some action can be taken by an individual or his physician to prevent a genetic related disease or disorder from occurring or to alter in some way its natural progression. She did not provide a list of qualifying genes. The FABCITS paper from 2010 defined it as uh, there is an established therapeutic or preventative intervention or other available actions that have the potential to change the clinical course of the disease and also did not provide any list of qualifying genes. The Dorschner group um, more recently uh, used actionable genes in adults um, defined as having deleterious mutations whose penetrance would result in specific defined medical recommendations, both supported by evidence and when implemented expected to improve outcomes in terms of mortality or the avoidance of morbidity. And they did provide a list. Um, and the definition is getting longer. And the green paper that you've heard so much about actually, as far as I could tell, didn't use the A word, but did create a list of 56 genes. And they described these as those for which preventative measures and or treatments were available and disorders in which individuals with pathogenic mutations might be asymptomatic for long periods of time. And um, why is this concept coming up now just in the last um, number of years? I, I think it mostly is being driven by the next generation sequencing and this discovery of incidental and off-target genes. And historically, in deciding what should be provided in the clinical setting or what might be morally incumbent on researchers to provide in the medical um, community has generally embraced information that leads to something that you can prevent or treat, which I think is also connected to the economics of this in that you had to justify to third party payers why they should be covering this test. It's not the only reason, but it, I think it's an important historical reason for why actionability has been elevated to where it is elevated. And I think there's also been an assumption that actionability is what patients would value the most. So I'm, I'm flashing at you here the list of um, 114 or whatever it was genes from the Dorschner group that they considered actionable. And now I'm showing you in red the ones that overlaid what the green group um, described as actionable. And so we can see that the experts don't actually agree on what this list should look like. Gandhi said that honest disagreement is often a good sign of progress, so we think we're making pretty good progress. And I think in identifying the differences in the way people think about things uh, is really important in making progress. So one of the uh, pieces of conversation that's come out of working with um, Dr. Wolf's, Susan Wolf's group here is whether or not this term actionability is actually a property of the gene mutation or is it context specific? And to put that in high relief here is a pathogenic mutation in BRCA1, which is our poster gene for actionability, actually actionable when you find it in a 92-year-old man. And as a physician, I can tell you, no, it's not. But if it's found in a 31-year-old woman, it, it's extremely actionable. So in deciding whether or not returnable results um, are returnable, does a researcher actually have to weigh the particular situation of each family member and take into account their longevity, their gender, their reproductive issues, their psychological resiliency, their, all the other parameters? 
And I would just offer, in my opinion, that it probably, for practical purposes, needs to be gene-based and not person-based. There is a severe lack of tools, resources, and wisdom to parse the potential meaning for each gene for each person on a personal basis. But in so giving in to this easy route, we do need to acknowledge that sharing information on some, quote, actionable genes will actually have little or no utility for some recipients, no matter how carefully you, you vet that list of genes. And so I, I suggest here that one could think about you know, a simple diagram of, of all genes, and there's this group here of, of the genes that, have, that, that make it to these actionable lists. There's the genes that really we all agree aren't actionable, and they're those that we today don't really know what they mean or, or somewhere in between. And at the end of the day, one could provide education and choices leading to disclosure based on individual context and preferences, and that could apply to any number or, or types of genes. So the experts are not in full agreement. How do the non-medical people think about actionability? So I've had the opportunity to be involved in a um, large uh, web-based survey of 900 individuals across the U.S. population. So this is different from uh, Dr. Peterson's pancreatic cancer registries. And because this wasn't um, disease-based, it's also theoretical. We weren't really offering gene testing to folks here. And it was a very complicated survey, but relevant to this talk, about 90% said that actionability was important in considering what was important in deciding what to learn about. 43% embraced the idea of using a list made by experts, and the majority wanted to make their own decisions, which is a recurrent theme here, and they felt great confidence in their ability to be able to do so. So we went one step further, and we actually gave them a bunch of clinical scenarios and asked them to score it for actionability. And we gave them four choices shown here of the treatable, mostly treatable, mostly not treatable, entirely not treatable, and, and laid them out for them and said, so what do you think? And so we had a BRCA-type scenario, and, and the majority of people lumped that into the treatable, mostly treatable category, but not everybody did. And I think this level of disagreement here is um, a, a hint of some of the miscommunication that may occur when we use expert-derived lists, because what I mean as treatable might not be what you mean as, as, as treatable. And then we went on to some other conditions that were not on anybody's list here. So here was a congenital deafness scenario, and you can see kind of the, the type of descriptions we gave here. And here we ended up with about 58% that put it as mostly treatable and uh, almost half that decided it was mostly not treatable. Not much agreement here. And I'll flash out you just a list of, of uh, you, I don't even show you what the conditions are here, but this is from uh, treatable to untreatable here and how people scored these different conditions. And the ones not shown, uh, we told them in the STEM that it's not treatable, so we didn't ask them to score that. And Remember that the reason for driving all of this is we're going to try to link this to return of results, either clinically or on a research basis. So we did ask them the question after this, so would you want this result? And the would you want this result bars now are shown on, over on the right, and the purple and the blues are yes, I definitely want it or pretty much want it. And you could see that it actually didn't, link very well with how people scored actionability. In fact, the conditions that were entirely untreatable had the highest level of people who said, yeah, I want that result. I'm just reporting it. <laughs> so we broke it down then by person level and said, okay, how does this look as individual people? So it turned out that about 30% or so of, of people said, I want all results no matter what. And about 16% of people said, I want no results, no matter what. And everybody else wanted to do a little bit of picking and choosing. So I, I think at the end, we, we realize the experts aren't agreeing with each other. The, the, across the population, there isn't much of a consensus about what actionability means. And I think we need to do a lot more discussion and conversation about um, how to offer meaningful choices to people that communicates with how they think about things in the world and uh, be aware of our limitations at this point in time. Thank you. <laughs>
So coming up next, we have genomic sequencing for tumor profiling from cancer research to cancer care. Dr. Mark Robson. I bring you greetings from the battlefield. We are sort of, in oncology, we're in the middle of a huge research experiment that involves uh, genomics and certainly is substantially overlapping with the kinds of questions we've been talking about today. I mean, for quite a while now, we've been practicing oncology and making treatment decisions on the basis of um, some very standard parameters, and those are basically histopathology, which can be souped up with certain special tests, and imaging, and made all of our treatment decisions, all of our clinical trial assignment, everything based upon those two parameters. And now, in the last few years, uh, we're in the process of investigating this idea that if we define the genomic landscape of mutations in a tumor, we can more accurately and hopefully less toxically design an effective therapy for the patient. And in pursuit of this, we have been embracing as a, as a specialty the idea of tumor mutational profiling. And this is done in various ways by various places. Of course, there are commercial entities that are basing their entire business plan on it. Um, but just about every academic medical center now is rolling out some variant of their own profiling technique. And the purposes are threefold. At least the clinical purposes of this are threefold. One is we already fortunately know about certain sequence variants that are linked to responses to approved drugs. So if we find that, we're in a sense home free. The person goes on to that treatment because we've already established through the routine clinical trial mechanism that that's the best way to go about doing it. Pragmatically, most of the time we're doing this kind of sequencing so that we can identify candidates for clinical trials of targeted approaches and ultimately the idea will be to use those trials in comparison to more standard empirically selected therapy to see if the hypothesis is true. And in the public imagination and uh, perhaps unfortunately in some of the uh, some of the non-academic places, uh, people are hoping to use tumor mutational profiling to quote unquote personalize or precision medicine their patients and take off-the-shelf drugs and apply them in circumstances where they haven't been established as efficacious. The whole approach also has a, a significant implications for the research enterprise. Of course, we're trying to do this to discover new targets in places where we had not formally thought to seek them. And uh, equally importantly, we're trying to discover resistance mechanisms to both new and existing therapeutics uh, for the same purpose of optimizing therapy. Now, this is our most recent targeted capture panel. We call it IMPACT. I think nine out of 10 people who have this call it IMPACT for some reason. And uh, as you can see, it includes on it in the shaded boxes a number of genes that are clearly established as being associated with cancer susceptibility syndromes in uh, the other contexts, in clinical contexts, and when they're mutated in the germline. Yet none of these are controversial. You, know, you can have discussions about penetrance, you can have discussions about variants of uncertain significance, but these have all been pretty robustly associated with predisposition syndromes. The ones in red uh, are relevant to us because these, for the genetics people in the audience, know are, are associated with a non-cancer predisposition syndrome, Lois Dietz, which is a cardiovascular syndrome. And so even in this relatively limited gene set, uh, those of us in the oncology space are already being pulled a little bit outside of our comfort zone. But nonetheless, most of the things that are on this panel that could be found mutated in the germline are already relevant to the oncology enterprise. So how, if we're doing this for the purposes of defining research eligibility, and it's essentially a research screening tool, how do we get into the germline and the issue of incidental findings and the whole set of questions that we're wrestling with today? And it can happen in two different ways. It can happen indirectly because most of the DNA of the tumor is the same as the constitutional DNA that the person was born with, and so the germline variants shine through, if you will. Um, or it can happen directly. Institutions can make decisions that they're going to directly sequence and call germline DNA uh, in addition to the tumor sequence. 
Now, this is the way things have started. This is the pathway that the most, uh, most widely available commercial enterprise uses, which is that they have tumor DNA, they sequence it, and then they compare that to a reference standard, not derived from the patient, just some accepted reference. And then when they find a variation, they don't know a priori whether or not that's a germline variant or a somatic variant. And for various reasons, they don't care. Uh, and they haven't wanted to get into the decision making, but on the other hand, I do, and so do the people in the protocol, because when these variants show up, we get calls from the treating oncologists or the treating investigators saying, should this person now be evaluated for germline predisposition? So if you find a BRCA2 mutation, then perhaps that person needs to be sent in. The challenge is these are often found out of context. So I was actually talking to, um, to Mr. Nelson this morning, and it turns out that recently we had um, a case of this with a gentleman who had an anaplastic thyroid carcinoma who had a BRCA2 deletion, and we couldn't figure out for the world of us what was going on there, except it turned out when we dug into his family history that seven years before he'd had a pancreatic cancer that had been treating, treated with a platinum-based agent, and so now all of a sudden the pieces fell into place and it started making sense. So this is not an uncommon problem for us now, and we're doing a, a pretty nice second opinion business dealing with these. But it is an issue from the purposes of the, the purpose of doing the test. This is detritus. This is stuff that we didn't want. It's not relevant to the reason why we did it. And so a lot of places now are doing simultaneous tumor and normal se sequencing and subtracting the normal sequence from the, the tumor sequence before the variants are reported out so as to avoid all the messiness of the germline. Um, it's not always completely effective. There are reasons why in quality control checks and the like, you can wind up seeing uh, copy number variation or deletions within the uh, DNA, even when you try to mask it this way. But the way we're doing this at our institution right now, everything is essentially cut out and all that comes out at the end is variants that are only identified in the tumor, not in the germline. Now, that has some consequences, one of which is that if there is a germline variant, we don't see it. So there's information loss, and I'll talk in a little bit about uh, why we're going to try to start going around that. But in the research enterprise, that's also not good. Uh, and so what happens in the research side is that the investigators sometimes want to know exactly what's going on. So for instance, if they see a mutation in the tumor at a particular locus, they want to know whether or not that is a second hit and that the individual actually did have a germline mutation because that would then be, in the discovery sense, a priori evidence that that gene was important. This happened recently in um, a particularly rare type of ovarian cancer called hypercalcemic small cell carcinoma of the ovary, which was not previously known to be associated with any particular gene, but one of our investigators uh, started doing tumor profiling on these and found a number of mutations in the somatic side uh, in a gene called SMARC-A4. This was kind of an interesting situation because half the time it turned out that uh, other family members had had a same diagnosis of this incredibly rare tumor. And so logically, the investigator wanted to know whether or not this was germline and started opening up the germline BAMs and sure enough found out that in about half of the cases this is a germline predisposition syndrome for a disease that probably strikes women at about the age of 18 and is routinely fatal when it occurs. Now, this started becoming a problem for us because this, exist, this um, investigation had been done some period of time after the patients had been ascertained at Memorial and as a matter of fact, all the patients who had this disease that were seen at Memorial were dead. And so now we are in the return of results to family circumstance that we described earlier. It can also happen much more volitionally. There have been a, a number of people who've made a, a fairly vigorous argument that you have the germline sequence information at least come off the machine, even if you can't interpret it, and that there is perhaps um, an obligation to, to go and mine that for potentially meaningful findings because otherwise you are sort of losing an opportunity. And so the idea of doing germline sequence calling actively to try to figure out whether or not there's something in there that's relevant is, is something that's gaining some traction. 
And if you do this, you're going to find stuff. Uh, we went and we anonymized about 400 cases just to see how likely it was that we would find things. And uh, of those 400 cases, about 7% of them had either pathogenic or likely pathogenic variants in one of the ACMG 56. So um, in the cancer space, this is going to become a real issue. Because we're thinking about doing 10,000 of these a year, which means that we might wind up with at least 700 types of variants to be found. So do the participants in this kind of research want to know this information? This is just a, a big cut at this. We have two ascertainment protocols. One is our general biospecimen ascertainment protocol, which is signed by or offered to essentially everybody who walks in the door at Memorial as a new patient. Um, and then the other is specifically a mutational profiling protocol. And we ask them a number of questions regarding future use and desire for return of results at the end of their consent. One of them is just, if we found something that was potentially meaningful, would you want to be recontacted with research results? And as you can see, the majority of people affirm that they do indeed want to be recontacted. Interestingly, the people that are earlier in their disease course, which is the 06107 group, are slightly less likely to want the information. I, I think I don't have any real hypothesis to why that's the case. Um, but it also applies to the question about that we've put on there that if you are not available, which is sort of a nice way of saying if you're not here, um, would you identify for us a family member or someone to receive the information, this type of research information? And fully a quarter of the initial enrollees say no. They decline to identify anybody um, and essentially don't want any information transmitted to their family. Whereas in the people that are a little bit further along in their disease course and having mutational profiling, it's, it's a much wider acceptance. It's still not 100%, though. It's about 90% of people identify a surrogate to receive information. So we're doing a little bit of formative work here, doing some qualitative interviews, I, the kind of thing that was described a little bit earlier today, um, working with now patients who have undergone tumor profiling. So this is not entirely theoretical to them, asking them specifically about what they would want and, and how they would feel about it. And in general so far, although the N is still very small, um, there is support for the concept that families should have access to the results um, but there are also various qualifications on it and, and a little bit of an unease with the idea of it being completely open to any family member who wanted to come. So we're going to start working now moving towards routinely offering people germline impact testing because these issues are, are just very, very thorny. And it's probably easier for us in the long run to set up the parallel sequencing pipeline to, to do the upfront consenting and to return results to the individual concerned at the time uh, than it is to uh, try to deal with the issue of uh, incidental results reporting and recontacting and the like. Uh, and so we're going to start relatively soon, probably in the next couple of months, uh, routinely doing parallel somatic and germline workflows. And um, hopefully we'll be able to uh, get a little bit more traction on this without worrying so much about going back to people afterwards. Thank you very much. And uh, hope to have a conversation about this later on. Appreciate it. So we're up to our last speaker, uh, Rebecca Branham, returning results relating to reproductive health. So I'll try and keep this quick because I know I'm standing between us and the fun discussion section. But I want to step back a little bit um, from the real specifics and talk about really the debate on return of results itself and where we stand right now um, and how it's really being discussed. And specifically, I want to talk about reproductive health and how we are or more, more realistically aren't talking about it in this conversation. So here's a quick overview of where I intend to head. Um, so generally, what we've seen in our work is that the broad guidelines on what to return identify variants in three categories. Those of health importance, those of reproductive importance, which generally means carrier status, and those of personal utility. And you see that um, in several examples in the, that we've talked about here today. What we haven't seen, however, is guidance on how to address results that explicitly impact reproductive health and whether or not they should or may be returned. And we make the argument that this omission is particularly burdensome to women and should be addressed. So I think a really easy way to understand health importance and reproductive importance is to look at the 
look at examples. So we've heard a lot today about BRCA. The ACMG list is an, another list of variants that are really, they're pathogenic and actionable is however we want to define actionability. Um, but generally what's been in the recommendations papers, when they talk about reproductive importance, it's almost exclusive to carrier status. So um, things like sickle cell, um, Duchenne muscular dystrophy, LESH9, that sort of thing. What isn't addressed here, however, is what falls in between. And that's reproductive health importance. It's not necessarily about carrier status, and it's not necessarily about a person's health all throughout their life, but when they're moving on to create their own families. And that omission is, is problematic. So what do we mean specifically by reproductive health importance? As we see it, we think of it as a difficulty or impossibility in conceiving, um, the adverse course of pregnancy, or an adverse outcome of pregnancy, such as miscarriage. Um, some of the variants that have been listed as potentially returnable to people do have reproductive implications. For example, Turner syndrome, Kleinfelter, and others have, and for example, infertility implications. But when they're discussed in the literature, their reproductive health implications are not given as reasons to return to people. They're generally focused on cancer and on screening for other types of health interventions. There had, there's one exception that we did find, um, which was during a Caesar presentation, Will Fun and Goddard referenced returning acute fatty liver of pregnancy, which can be fatal for women. So that is an exception. Um, and so everyone asks us for examples when we talk about this. So here are some examples. Um, as I mentioned, acute fatty liver of pregnancy can result in maternal and infant death. Um, there can be premature ovarian failure for other conditions, repeated miscarriage, ovarian insufficiency. And as we move on in genetic science, it's almost um, unavoidable that we're going to be finding more. Um, this isn't to say that there aren't conditions that don't fall in both categories. Like I said before, there are certain things that affect health, but also affect reproductive health. So, um, sorry, there was some formatting issue here. But basically what we want to argue is that reproductive health needs to be considered as part of health in deciding what warrants return to individuals. And it should be considered as part of health for three important reasons. Um, first, because these variants and conditions can be burdensome, they're significant, and they're often actionable both by clinicians and by the probands themselves. So first off, with infertility, um, it's a widespread issue. 12% of women and one in eight couples experience infertility. Um, miscarriages are medically and psychologically significant events for women. And then often invasive and burdensome procedures are required both in fertility testing and through assisted reproductive technology. Um, in addition to being burdensome and, and significant, they're also actionable, both by clinician and by the proband themselves. So it might not be billable, but that doesn't mean that there's that we can't do anything about it. So there is increased monitoring for at-risk pregnancies. Um, there are early prognosis can lead to better outcomes. But also, reproductive health is actionable to individuals who want to make different life choices about when they're going to conceive, whether they want to undertake certain assistive reproductive technologies and the like. Um, so essentially, putting these three together, we see reproductive health as a specific subset that needs to be addressed in this discussion. Um, it matters to probands, and that means, at least in my opinion, that it should matter to clinicians and researchers too. Um, excluding reproductive health itself really alienates a subset of the population, and that pregnancy is of great importance to a lot of women in their lives, and they, it's something they go through and will have effect on their health. Um, when we're talking about the health implications and actionability, we need to include these, and we can't, um, the way we're defining reproductive and health actionability right now is not addressing that middle, um, that middle section. And of course, this isn't to say that this doesn't have implications for men as well. There are several genetic conditions that have um, infertility implications for men, but given um, some of the really serious conditions that can affect pregnancy, we see it as a particular burden in that, in that realm. So now that we're talking about reproductive health, I'm gonna make it a little bit worse. So now that we're really taking reproductive health seriously, can we still justify 
a really hard line between health, reproductive health, and what we call reproductive variants, meaning carrier status. It's clear that people care about carrier status, and they often pursue genetic counseling for this purpose specifically. And if we acknowledge the importance of reproduction to patients and probands, it makes it more difficult to justify a harsh cutoff. And part of the reason why that harsh cutoff isn't warranted is that probands often act on this information. We know that women, particularly with knowledge of Duchenne muscular dy dystrophy, make different reproductive health choices and life planning choices. Um, providing this kind of information, if we do, if researchers or clinicians do choose to return information, doesn't necessarily mean that we be violating a right not to know, and it's certainly an area in which a right not to know would have to be protected, because it is, for many people, a very controversial area. Of course, we acknowledge that the cost and feasibility of returning all carrier statuses makes this quite an interesting endeavor. However, that's not to say that all carrier statuses are created equal. In particular, um, carrier statuses such as X-linked disorders that have a higher probability of affecting particularly male children um, should be strongly considered, particularly when they're particularly harmful to the offspring. So again, circling back to the beginning, um, we still do think that carrier status in general needs to be kept in a permissible return basket. However, um, health importance moving forward as we see it should um, include established risk for serious conditions which include the difficulty or impossibility of conceiving and as well as um, adverse course or failure of pregnancy. So a quick wrap, wrap up. Um, the recommendations so far aren't really talking about reproductive health, and there's a danger that reproductive health can get lost in the overlap between health importance and reproductive importance. Um, researchers and clinicians should consider the reproductive health importance to their probands, even if they can't, if clinicians can't act on it specifically, and that um, variants affecting reproductive health are burdensome and can be actionable, and that Taking reproduction seriously invites careful consideration of what carrier status results might be considered for discretionary return. Thanks. Well, why don't I take my prerogative as moderator to ask a question. Uh, so both Noralene and, and Rebecca were addressing issues relating to actionability. And so I'm just sort of personally curious, tying it into our topic specific topic today, which is relating to return of results, not to the subject themselves, but rather to the relatives. I'm curious whether or not uh, the whole notion of defining actionability, whether any added feature of that, there is an added feature of that when you go from returning the results to the subject versus returning them to the relatives. In other words, if we've defined what actionability should mean, is there any reason not to just be employing whatever that definition is and determine whether or not we would return, determine the results are actionable to the subject? And once you've determined that, uh, you could apply the same definition to all of the relatives. And if it meets the relatives, then you could return it to them. If anybody's willing to kind of take that on. Okay. So let me share a debate that we've had within our project about this question, Jerry. When you're talking about actionability as to the proband, you know that this is their result, right? You're over that hump. And the question is, is this a result that tells you something you believe about the pathogenicity and the actionability? But when you then take the proband's result and ask, is it actionable as to the family member, you don't even know yet whether they share that result. Mm -hmm. And even if you would predict that they'd share that result if they're biologically related, some of them think they're biologically related and they're not biologically related for various reasons, misattributed paternity, undisclosed you know, adoption, or non-relatedness, et cetera. So this kind of really uh, has been a challenge to our project to think, so is actionability of the proband's result as to the relative, that what the relative can do is the, then go get their own testing, 
to verify whether indeed they share the result. And if the answer to that is yes, then we can progress to is it actionable for them in their context. But you see the problem. There's a hump in there to get over. You don't start actually knowing whether it's actionable as to the relevant, because you don't know whether they actually share it. So could I comment on that? So uh, first of all, I want to really appreciate, uh, express my appreciation for Lainey's presentation, because I, I think it really helped to sort of flesh out um, just how, uh, how ambiguous the meaning of actionability is now and how much we need to do more work on that. Um, but I, I think we could, uh, I, I think one way to thread our way through what you just described, and it would solve other problems too. It would solve a problem that uh, Pearl O'Rourke raised about um, uh, resources, is to, is to have our should threshold apply, it be a very high threshold. In other words, the, the higher the threshold, um, the more comfortable, I, first of all, the, the fewer instances we will have of return, the more comfortable we will be about feeling that we're offering some value in the return. And if, if, if you're willing to go with me that far, <laughs> I would say um, there's, there's a point at which it may not matter that the relative has only a 50% chance or a 30% chance or whatever the calculation turns out to be. It is an issue of great importance to the family. It's an issue of great importance to uh, relatives of this person, even, not, even if not themselves. It's, it's important for them to figure out what their status is. And in fact, they'll be very glad if they don't hap, hap, happen to have inherited it. But I think those kinds of benefits really play out best if we're calling for a very high threshold. And that begs the question, what do we mean by a high threshold? OK, very nice. Uh, from the audience. Um, so I've got a question from the laboratory side. So Susan talked quite a bit about trans transitioning research testing to a CLIA lab, right? Um, CLIA recognizes cytogenetics as a specialty, right? Cy CLIA doesn't even recognize molecular genetics, period, right? So how comfortable are y'all on the panel about when we're transitioning these things to a quote unquote CLIA lab, that that CLIA lab knows what they're doing? Because there's no regulation from CLIA whatsoever for anything molecular. So in that transition, how, how do you know that that lab, that that lab, the CLIA lab, is doing things to the same extent that the research lab did? Well, you've just articulated one of the absurdities about the idea that a research result has to then be confirmed in a CLIA lab. Uh, sometimes it doesn't make sense. Though CLIA is not the only source of standards for molecular labs. And so we all know CLIA is a very limited instrument. I mean, I happen to agree with what Wiley just said, so I'm not arguing against that. But the reality is that CLIA is a, just a sort of very crude quality floor. And it doesn't, you're right, get into the details of um, molecular uh, diagnostics. And, but there are other standards that come into play for that. And the larger question, really, because we're talking not just in the big policy picture, we're talking not just about research results, but also about clinical results, is what kind of standards, proficiency testing, other pr procedures do we need as we begin to move this kind of testing into translational genomics and then into the clinic? This is a question uh, for Mark. Uh, I really enjoyed your, your talk. And I just had a um, question about, you referred near the end that there, you're planning to do 10,000 genomes um, a year, and that would generate 700 plus cases to um, share the results from. Do, do you see that uh, a particular number as a threshold over which it just becomes infeasible to be able to uh, take, undertake that? Um, uh, because at the, your last slide, I think, suggested that you're going to do that uh, for that, that population. Okay. So I think that the extant model that we not I mean, we're a little bit fortunate because since we're focused on the cancer space, we're doing 400 genes. 
it's you know, 50 or so are relevant, not X homes and then we'll talk about um, the whole range of possibilities. Um, but I think we probably are going to move uh, more to an ascent slash opt out type of model with relatively limited upfront education rather than a, a really formal shared decision making upfront type of approach just because of the feasibility issue. Um, Can you use that mic next to you? I'm sorry that one's not working. Not working. Right. So what I was saying is, is that we've thought about that and, and I think we have to acknowledge that the existing uh, formal pretest counseling model is probably not going to be viable and so we're trying to, to think of what are the elements of education that need to be provided so that people can make an informed decision to opt out and um, and then move forward from there and try to essentially get most of the education and infor information provided on the back end. Could, could I just ask a, a quick follow-up to that? Um, so are there any other more collective ways that you could get at that? I'm just thinking if you're going to minim not rely so much on the individual pretest counseling to a, to a very high degree with, with, with potential patients, are there any other groups at, at Memorial that you're consulting with to get advice about how to do that? Or is it driven primarily, um, is it expert driven or are there some, is there some way to get potential participant involvement in, in figuring out what that would look like. It just seem, seems to me it would be an interesting uh, exercise. Yeah, I, I agree. So, so we're doing this in collaboration with the patient education group who does a, a fair amount of that type of work yeah. in, in terms of trying to bounce things off people and, and get them to validate it's not the right word because that implies a certain degree of rigor that perhaps is not applicable, but yeah. certainly not just making it up and throwing it out there. We're trying to do some testing before we really launch it. But Mark, when you talk about transitioning to an uh, opt-out model, that's for the genomic analysis itself. That's for the germline. Okay. Only the germline, not the somatic? Correct. Because the reason they're having the testing done is for the somatic. So, so I mean, they can opt out of the somatic as part of just not wanting to do it, period. And then in terms of returning results, returning information, would that too be opt-out? Um, I suppose that the conceptualization is that the opting out of the germline information is done at the time of the consent. You know, so, so they're told the kinds of information they could receive and then asked whether or not they want to receive it. Okay. It's still it's a little fuzzy to me. I hear the opt out of the germline. I'm not sure what model you're talking about in terms of getting results. If you're asking people do you want or not want the results, that part may not be opt out. That part, that may be opt in. I guess I don't understand the distinction. Well, I mean, you could say to people, look, uh, you can opt out, but what we do here and what we recommend is this analysis. However, there's a separate question here about what information to offer back to you. Um, for example, we may get into incidental findings that have nothing to do with the disease that brings you to Memorial, where you might actually give people a choice and say, do you actually want these? I mean, that's not part of the package deal, so don't worry, but you could have them if you want them. Right. So Again, we're doing a limited number of genes, and so we think that we would be able to describe that relatively generically up front instead of having to do, for instance, a Berg bin or something like that. I think we can give them just a broad sense of we may find something that's related to cancer susceptibility you know, that may or may not be related to diseases that are in your family, and then try to get them to either affirm or, or deny that they want that kind of information. I mean, obviously, people would also have the option to opt out when such results are available because then they're going to have to be called in and offered them. So there's always a chance that they're going to be able to, to get away from that. But at least up, for, up front to, to try to get them a, essentially a broad consent, if you will. It's a form of broad consent. Can I ask Mark a, a different question to just real uh, quick? Just, do we have a follow-up on oh, that one? I, I had a follow-up to, to that sure. uh, question, which was, if the main driver for return of research results is based in, in a, an ethics to say that this is the right thing to do, 
Yeah, then the question which relates to a point that was brought up earlier today was, is there ever a number that is too large to say that this is not uh, feasible, that we should, in fact, whatever we decide as a threshold for that action, actionability should be, it, you know, 10,000 is a very impressive number, 50,000 be even more impressive number, but, but if it's the right thing to do from an ethics standpoint, it is, is there ever a number that it's too high? I mean, I, I think that it's obviously resource limited and one has to become creative about how one's going to go about doing it. To a sense, you know, the conversation that we're just having is, is a response to that exigency. The number is high. We felt that the information is important or, you know, that there's been a group of people who have made kind of come to that conclusion um, and, you know, quote unquote, should be offered. And so rather than say, but it's too difficult because we don't have the resources to do it the way we've always been doing it, the answer is, okay, let's try to figure out what the model is to get our minimum requirements in so that we can meet that load. And, and I think that this does extend. If in the future we really are doing more broad genomic profiling on people as a matter of routine, you know, I don't know how, you know, in the family practice clinics or wherever, I mean, how are we going to build the resources to deploy our traditional model to make that happen? You know, I, I would add that I think the issue of resource utilization always has an ethical element to it. We're talking about trade-offs. Uh, and uh, in addition to the, the kind of framing that Mark just referred to, I think we're likely to get to a situ situation where we say, how many secondary results do we want to generate? Uh, maybe there are circumstances where we could do exome or could do targeted gene sequencing, and targeted gene sequencing is much better because it reduces this particular dilemma. Uh, but I think it's exactly those, those kinds of trade-offs clearly have an ethical dimension to them. Did you want to yeah, just wrap so it up? Mark, you had a slide and you talked about the scenario where after the death of the patient, maybe it was a patient participant, uh, you ascertain new genomic information. And so that person's dead, and now you're wondering should we communicate this to the family? And can you just share how you all have handled that and what your thinking is on that? So we have two different scenarios, if you will. We have a legacy challenge of people who um, consented to these kinds of studies before we started thinking about the problem and modifying our consents, and, and those who um, consented afterwards. So recently, with our more modern consent, I think we feel reasonably comfortable that we have some, at least some indication of subject preferences, participant preferences, and um, although we haven't followed the, the HIPAA regulation strictly, we have an identified family representative for those individuals, identified by the participant. So that, you know, that, that pathway is a little bit cleaner. This pathway um, we have, as I think I'd mentioned earlier today, we have within the IRB a group of individuals, um, which is a multidisciplinary group, includes um, clinical geneticists, it includes laboratory scientists, patient representatives, legal, you know, the whole ethics committee chair, the whole sort of gamut, and um, uh, everything is taken on essentially a case-by-case -case basis. So if an investigator identifies something like this that they think should be considered for return, um, there's a process whereby they report that to this committee through the IRB, and it's deliberated upon, and um, if it's felt that it's appropriate for return, it's handed off to the clinical genetic service, and we work with the, we work with the um, ordering physician or treating physician to, to recontact the family to try to communicate the information. So, so is, this is a, it's not really, it's not one of the IRB panels that just gets up to speed on these issues, for example. This is a completely separate group. This is a designated committee, subcommittee of the IRB. So the committee reaches a recommendation, which is then presented to the full IRB for validation or not, as the case may be, and then, then moves forward there. So it's all done 
the ultimate authority is the IRB as a whole, the ultimate approval authority. I think if we want to be on time, right? He had 4.15, it's basically 4.15, so we, we have can to- go a little bit further. Do you want to go further? Okay. There has been a lot of commentary that with sort of personalized medicine is personal responsibility uh, for people to take charge of their own information. Uh, with the idea that as genomes are going to become more common, people will have access to their own genome and discovery. Is there a point at which you can decrease the burden of contact by registering patients, giving them a portal access to their information so that they can choose to look for that information that would include information that would educate them as to what it may mean or even who to contact, but at least the burden of contact would be put on the individual with, if they're interested, they could access that information. I, I think that that's going to be the future. Um, genetics, genomics is too big. This volume of information coming just doesn't fit with the current healthcare model. The resources in our healthcare system are shrinking, and there has to be something like that. I think not, not just dumping off that responsibility onto the internet, though, I think one can also create programs that help people acquire the education and the insight into the decisions that they're making and can walk them through some sort of systematic way of saying yay and nay to the results. That doesn't exist right now. There are some fledgling programs that have started trying to do something like that, but it, to me, looks like it has to be the answer for the future. <laughs>